Notice down here we you listed are the contributors. So, and what else is included? It, it's Bert Archer from what is in that parentheses? It's the, the magazines they write for, right? So that's a form of parenthetical citation, and it establishes their credibility, right? These people write for these big publications, the only one of which you might recognize is, I don't know, do you recognize any of those? You might, as your, at, what, what would you be more interested in telling you who the saddest songs are about? What kind of magazine would you look for? Rolling Stone, Spin, I don't know, what, whatever magazines you noticed. So you can probably guess, right, that this you're not the audience for this. That's how you make judgments here, right? I'm not probably the intended audience for this. I mean, you can go back. Look at how they how they cited the songs. We'll start with the the band Rocking Chair. 1969. Oh, that's probably not songs you're real familiar with, huh? A little before your time. Is this how you would cite a song in your work cited if you're writing an academic piece analyzing the saddest songs ever? No. What would you have to do? You'd have to put it in a works cited list, right, with the album and the, the record company, with all of the required details. But notice they are consistent. Tom Waits, Chris, what, so what is the quotation mark here? This is the saddest song ever, by the way. Ever. <laughs> what, but what does it mean, Christmas, why, why is Christmas card from a hooker in Minneapolis in quotation? That's the song title. What if, what if it was italicized? The album. the album, right? Right? You know that those are those little punctuation marks are important because they tell us the see baby you said they tell us we know this is a song title and not an album title, right? So we, we could download the single instead of go get the album, right? These are important cues to us. And notice they're consistent with it for all of them. And why why the year? <coughs> Why do you think they put the year up? Why is that important? It's just like your earlier example, right? Is this up to date? Is this like the most current, saddest songs ever? Yeah, this is really like ever <laughs> they're talking, right? This is all old school stuff. Good. Okay, so now, what if we wanted to look at? Pull up my email. We don't ever want to. Music, mood, and marketing. I think we're probably getting close to out of time. Huh? So look at this this source. What do you, what do you think? What kind of source is this? Is this the time waster at work? That music affects human beings in various ways has probably been presumed as long as people have played music. Many marketing practitioners already accept this notion, given that music is increasingly used as a stimulus in, re in the retail environment as well as in radio and television advertising. Yet fewer than 20 published empirical studies in marketing have music as a what? Who is this appealing to? So it's some kind of professional piece, right? So how is credibility, credibility established right away? This goes back to your first. Jargon. A lot of jargon in here, right? So it's appealing to somebody who has, who knows whatever empirical studies, um, relevant literature outside marketing, and provides research propositions to guide future studies, right? So you're only going to be interested in this if you're within that field. But you should be able to read it regardless of whether you're in the field. How would you do that? What does that 
that first thing, do, what is that first paragraph right there? That little paragraph offset. What's that called? It's an abstract. So by the time you've read that, you know what the article is going to argue, right? So that's where you start, is with the abstract. What is the main upshot of this article? What's it going to tell me? So the rest of the article is really establishing the credibility, right? Explaining that building on that, if that's going to be your claim, how did you get to it, right? So we assume that it's based on research, right? Look at all this. Look at one section. Ooh, Seedman, 1981. Review the contributions of music to media productions. Uh, further, the research of Manfred Kleins, 1975, 1977, 1980. Kleins and Nathan, 1982. What's going on there? A lot of numbers. What does that tell you about the author? paragraph. Just, just at a glance, what does this tell you about this author? He's educated, right? This person's read a lot, right? Who reads all of that 1975, right? So that's, the, that, that's how source citation establishes that this person has the grounds by which to make a claim that I'll listen to. Why is the years? Why, what, what, what format is this? Is this MLA? MLA is the style used by the is the style created by the Modern Language Association, right? And so, who uses MLA? Yes, in this English class, right? You probably do. Humanities. People who study things that are about language and human beings and all that stuff, right? And we talk about people. So we often use authors, but not dates, because we talk about the stuff that, you know, was relevant in Shakespeare's time, right? Or the history of the valley, right? So we're looking at longer term stuff. We don't emphasize dates. So this, this emphasizes dates, which is much more concerned with is it relevant? And who's more concerned with, is it relevant to right now? Is it the latest knowledge? Science, economics, right? We want the net, we need to know what's the most current stuff. What's the current stuff findings on these things? So that's why date gets emphasized in MLA and in APA. So, in, or I mean, excuse me, in APA, or it depends, I don't know that this is APA. What are these things here? Footnotes, and why do we use footnotes? To develop an idea that you don't want to say in the text. Okay, to develop an idea. But why, well, if you don't want to say it in the text, why have it? It could be as definitions as well. It could be what? Since those definitions may be something that they might help explain. Okay. So what does that say rhetorically to the reader? If there's, what is it, what are we thinking about in terms of our reader if we use footnotes? Okay, that they don't know or that they want to know, right? They want more. So what kind of reader wants more? Notice it's not like a hyperlink that they may or may not, of course they may or may not read the footnotes, but the assumption is that somebody's going to read that, right? So what does that tell you about what that kind of reader is like? As opposed to the person reading the walrus? They're just killing time, right? But the person who's reading this and is willing to read the footnotes and all that, what are they doing? Research, Research right? They're genuinely interested in what you're saying in order to solve some larger problem, not just to play a stats on, right? They want to know, they need to know more about the topic. So you put all of this information in, a, make it as available to them as possible now, if I read this and I say, really, Bud said that? Yeah, looking at this sort of thing here, Bud. 
I, that's exactly what I need to know. I need to, I need to use that source. So what am I going to do as an academic writer who's really actually interested in what, what gets said here? I'm going to go look for the reference, right? Because I want that source. I need that source. So that explains the logic of how a reference list, it's, you know you're lo looking at APA, um, or not MLA if it says references, if it's, if it's MLA, it's what's it called, works cited. So that's the distinction, one of the distinctions. But um, look at how those, the, this is organized, visually, just like your room when you walked in and you knew where you were supposed to face and why you're here, right? Look at how this is visually organized. How is it visually organized? Yeah, Alphabetical order, what? Alphabetical order is easy, right? If you look in the back, so notice that in the in-text citation where it said Bud, 1967 or whatever, that's gonna be the first letter, they, or the first word you see here, right? Because this is, it's set up for the reader to go find it easily, not have to try and figure it out, right? But I'm gonna scan the list, so what else do we notice visually about how this is set up? Visually though, what's this called? It's a hanging indent, right? How do we think of paragraphs being indented? The first line is indented in five spaces, right? That's because that visually is how we read, right? It's kind of like takes us through, like a path we can follow. This is the opposite because we just scan the first line here, right? Nobody reads works cited, right? You don't read Klein's, Manfred, 1975, communication, right? Nobody reads that. They look for specific key components of information, right? So, so when you're thinking about, just to wrap this up really quickly, when you're thinking about establishing your authority by using other sources and citing those sources, also think about what is the logic behind that. Why am I using APA or why am I using MLA? Why do I have the hanging indent? Why do I have to indicate that the title of the article is in quotations and the title of the journal is in italics? It's not because English teachers are fussy, right? It's because every, everything conveys a specific piece of information and has a reason and a logic and all of that, and your ability to use all of that, establishes your credibility. Tells the reader, this is someone who has read a lot. This is someone who pays attention to details. This is someone who cares about what they're talking about, which makes me care more about what they're talking about.